Hello and welcome to a video on sampling, frequency distributions, and graphs. In this video we're going to look at populations and being able to determine the difference between populations and samples, selecting appropriate sampling technique for the given population that you have and the way that you are going to go about sampling from that population, and we're going to look at organizing and presenting our data, and then identify ways that visual displays can be deceptive. So this section of, of notes we're dealing with statistics and that's two things that could be a, a, a course you know the entire study of the science of, of collecting the data and interpreting the data but it also is the things that we collect the the, um, the numbers that we run within a sample so it has two different meanings but the science that the thing that we are studying in this section is the method of collecting, analyzing, organizing, and interpreting data and drawing conclusions based on that data. All right, the two main branches that we discuss in here are descriptive and inferential statistics. In descriptive statistics, we're just talking about collecting and organizing the data and presenting it uh, in a way that, that um, conveys the message quickly and effectively. And then inferential is when we make generalizations from the data and draw conclusions towards the entire population from a uh, small subset of the population typically. All right, the population, that's who we're studying. That's, they're all the people, all the objects that we're trying to describe by the data. And the sample is a subset of that population. It's, it's not everybody. Uh, it's just a uh, small percentage, usually a drastically sm much smaller percentage than the entire population itself. And then a representative sample is what you're after. You're wanting a small subset of the population that typically has the same characteristics and, and usually targets the same percentages. It's like, for instance, if 10% of the population is left-handed, you would want around 10% of your sample to be left-handed, and male and female, and, and um, education levels, different things like that. The, the sample has properties that target the, the population as far as the, the breakdown and the ratios. So here's an example of the difference between populations and samples. So we've got a group of hotel owners in a large city and they decide to conduct a survey among the citizens of that city to discover their opinions about gambling. So we want to describe the population. Well the population is all the citizens of the city. Okay. Now they're going to sample from that and get a small subset of the of the citizens but the population is everybody that they could sample which means that would be everybody in the, the city all right and it's suggested that to survey all the people at six of the largest nightclubs in the city on a Saturday night about their opinion on cas uh, casino gambling that's what maybe somebody at this little group of hotel owners says that they should do would that be a good idea uh, they're they're thinking probably that, hey, the largest nightclubs, we can get a lot of the people there. We won't have to, you know, go door to door. No, that's not a good idea. Uh, the nightclub set is more likely to have a positive attitude towards gambling than the general population. So it's not a representative sample. All right, a random sample. Now this is what your ideally would would your sampling technique would ideally involve some type of randomness. Um, it's a Sample, a random sample is a sample that's obtained in a way that every element of the population, whether it be people or our objects, has an equal chance of being selected. All right, everything has to have an equally likely. We don't, we don't want to have something that's more likely than, than not or less likely than not. So in our method before, the nightclub set, you're not going to have a whole lot of, you know, 65 and 70 year old people in your sample if you're only sampling from the nightclub set. All right, you're not going to get anywhere near the same percentage of senior adults and then really young people because they're, they're not going to be able to be there or they're not going to want to be there. So a random sample has to have an equal chance of being selected. So that example that we had of, of what would be considered somewhat of like a cluster sample uh, gathering people that are at these nightclubs, that would not be a uh, a representative sample and because it, we're missing that random element. Randomness 
typically leads to a representative sample if you have a random sampling technique. All right, um, if you take a random sample, typically, or what we can kind of relate it to is uh, just assigning numbers and then randomly selecting numbers. There's a lot of technology out now that will randomly assign numbers, like these scientific calculators have a random number generator. So this number, option number five, if I've given everybody in this class a random number between one and 50, and then I could hit enter, and then I could just randomly call people with that random number. Right? And they have this in, in lots of different places. Excel has something simple, similar to this um, called random between. You type in equals and start typing random, and there's random between, and then the same thing, give it a number between one and whatever you want to stop at. And you can have it do that over and over and over again just by dragging down, and it can give you as many random numbers as you want. So random number generators, um, at this step when we're randomly selecting numbers after we've assigned each uh, element of the population a number. Now that would be difficult to assign each element of the population a number. If you're going to you know, go door to door and do it, um, you could might as well just ask them the question that you want to ask your sample. But uh, it, 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 is a, it is a method of, of collecting a random sample. All right, this next question has to do with these three choices. So we've got three choices. Which of the following is the best way to randomly sample about how these uh, citizens do feel about casino gambling? So we shut down the person's idea about going to the nightclubs. So maybe somebody else says, well, we could just randomly survey the people who live at the oceanfront condominiums in the city. All right, well, what's wrong with that? Well, many hotels... Uh, lie along the oceanfront with people who might object to the increased traffic right, uh, coming in there that that would uh, come from a casino where they could gamble. All right, and then this is the big thing. Yeah, that, that may be true, but this is the big thing. Just like with the, the, the casinos, you don't have, a, or not the casinos, but the nightclubs, you don't have an equal chance if you're only getting the people these oceanfront condos you're not getting people that don't live in the oceanfront condos at all there's no chance for them to be in the the, the sample all right all right what's wrong with this one survey the first 200 people whose names appear in the telephone directory not everybody's getting an equal chance all right the people who's zoo slattles or you know whatever the last name starts with the z they're not going to be able to be in the sample at all all right and then here's the, the thing that we're after why don't we just randomly select neighborhoods of the city and then randomly survey people within those neighborhoods? Yes, because that's going to give everybody a chance to be in the um, survey. Now, I don't, wouldn't know about this being an equal chance, um, the, the way it's written, but um, it does give everybody a chance. This would only be an equal chance if all these neighborhoods were of the same size. But it does give everybody um, a chance to be in there. And the key thing here is random, random. And everything's random here. So um, randomness increases the likelihood of a representative model. All right, frequency distribution. That's another big thing that we're going to do in this uh, section is, is after we come up with a sampling technique, here's our sample, here's the responses from the sample. Now we want to gather the data in an organized method and present it in a way that's efficient and not deceptive. We don't want to fool anybody with, with what we're doing here. So if you look, the only numbers that we see here are 10 through 18, right? So this is the data of the age, for the maximum yearly growth. So within a calendar year, how old were they when they grew the most? So you can see what happens it kind of builds up and then it kind of goes back down this is what we call like the normal distribution meaning it starts low it builds and it goes back down and it does it kind of symmetrically somewhat symmetrically but what this is is this this is a possible uh, answer in the data set and then this is how often that occurred the frequency 
uh, what we call this a frequency distribution is just a count of how many times this number occurred. So 10 occurred once, so we write it there. All right, 11 occurred twice, so we write 2 there. 12 occurred 5 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, oh, where's my last one? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right. So there's the five. Anyway, that's just these are just accounts of how often these things occurred. And when you're having the data listed like this, you can, you know, go through and cancel out. You know, there's one, twelve, two, three, and that's perfectly fine. That's the way most people would do it given this situation. But another way you can do this is to use Excel. Alright, so I've just listed all the numbers here in Excel just as they were presented to me. And then you would go to in Excel you would go to over here sort and you would tell it to sort from A to Z and now when I go back to the data set now I see it's listed over here in numerical order so 10, 11, 12, and I can count it easier I don't have to go through and look for it all now there is also a really really cool thing in Excel where you can type equals and then you can start typing count and then one of the options here is count if so I can double click count if and then it tells me the range we, what do you want me to count and I'll say all of these numbers and I just drag and highlight all the way down to the last data set and then I hit um, comma and then the criteria what what criteria do we want I want you to count the numbers in here that are 10 and we go back up to the top there's one 10 all right now I'm gonna highlight this Control C, Enter, and then in the second cell, I'm going to click up here to the formula bar. I'm going to hit Control V, and I'm going to change the 10 to an 11. All right, and there's two. All right, and then I'll go down here to the 12s, and I'll type in equals, well, or just paste, and then change that 10 to a 12. All right, and so you can see that it's putting that in order. Uh, or it's counting it. It's counting how many 12s or it would count how many 13s. Whatever I wanted it to count, it would count it for me. All right. So that's the count if feature. It's saying count how many numbers in here, but to be counted, you have to be equal to this number. All right. And it'll give you a count for that. So that's a, a way, a feature in Excel that, that makes really, really big data sets manageable. Now again, if it's only 35, it wouldn't be bad just to go ahead and cross them off like we were talking about. But for really big data sets, that's where this count if thing and, and sorting feature in Excel does a really great job of helping uh, ease that process. All right, so in this, once we get this uh, data set constructed, what are some of the conclusions we can con we draw from this example? So the, the maximum growth occurs between 12 and 15. All right, so that's what that means is the the age boys are um, when they grow the most happens between these these ages. All right, so that's the first thing we can conclude. The number of boys who attain their maximum yearly growth at a given age increases until we get to about 14, and then it starts to go back downhill. So the 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 most growth that, that kids show some very few kids you know in, in the 10 11 age range but it starts to increase you know the, the most growth you had was the 12 13 and then 14 but then once we get to 14 we start coming back down and there's very little late blooming kids like kids that grow after um, 14 and 15 years old it just doesn't occur that much it happens but it's rare All right, uh, here are test scores for a class with 40 students. Group the frequencies in the classes that are meaningful. And if it's a 10-point range, a 10-point scale, that would be the meaningful way. If it was a 7-point scale, then you would use that. But the 10-point scale, um, the, these especially, you know, this starts the D, C, B, A range. That's how we would group them. If there was a 100 in here, um, if we had a... You know, if this 80 had been a 100, it would be okay if one class had 90 to 100. You know, if one class was a little one unit bigger than the rest of them. 
because uh, that would be a, a grouping of, of an A category. A 90 is an A all the way to 100 is an A, so that'd be okay. But uh, you wouldn't want to make like this 80 to 90 and then this 91 to 100. You, you wouldn't want to try to compensate it somewhere. Uh, it, it's okay to, to adjust a class from time to time just by one unit if, if need be. All right, but if we take this data set and count who's in the 40 to 49 range and see if there's anyone in there in that range, there's a 45, 43. Are there any more? Am I missing any? Yes, right here, 47. All right, so in the 40 to 49 class, there were three. Okay, that's where that three's coming from. All right, and then you could go back and look at it again. The 50 to 59 class, you could count it. There ends up being six if we count that up, and so on and so on and so on. So once again, we see the grades kind of start low, they peak, and go back down. A lot of times, grades are roughly on a bell curve. All right. Histogram is basically if we take the yearly growth of boys thing that we were looking at back here, and we put the 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way to 18 on a plot, uh, or sorry, on an axis, and then the numbers 1 to 10 on an axis, this is exactly what we would get. We would get something that looks like this. All right, that's a histogram. They touch one beside the next one they touch. And then the frequency polygon is we just go to the midpoints. Like we're putting the 10 at the midpoint of these bars. And we put a dot at the top of the bar uh, over top of the 10. And we just run a straight line in between each um, consecutive bars, the, the midpoints on each consecutive bars. So that's a frequency polygon. And what these things do is they give us an idea of what the population probably looks like or how the population is probably distributed. So this was just 35 boys um, and when you know how old were they when they had their most growth. But what it suggests is that the age for the entire population that this that these 35 boys were sampled from probably has a bell curve. Meaning that we probably see something that peaks like this and then comes back down for all um, for all boys that these this population represented that you know things like 9 and 10 are going to be extremely rare as far as percents go but around 13 14 15 that's going to be fairly common the height represents how um, frequently it happens and then really low height are, are, are very low chances. If you go back to the last chapter, we called it probability. So these this height kind of represents like a probability curve. And um, these are like measures of likelihood. How often will we see something in this range? So that's, that's kind of the purpose of the frequency polygon. It, it gives us a, a shape of how the, the whole entire population is probably distributed. Stem plots or stem and leaf plots, these are a, uh, a means to do the same thing as the histogram, basically, to give a visual representation of where the most data occurs or where, you know, how the data is distributed. Now, this in this example and in, in, in our book in this particular section, the stems are the tens digits and the leaves are the units or the ones digits, but it doesn't always have to be that case. It could be the stems are the ten are the ones and then the leaves are the tenths. And it could be the stems are the uh, tenths and the leaves are the hundredths, you know, or, or, you know, the hundreds and the tens. It's always the stem, well, the leaves are your smallest unit of precision that your measurements are, are, are given. And the stem is the next smallest, the next, the next unit to the left, basically. Uh, but for the examples that we have here, the stems are tens and the leaves are the ones place. So if we made a stem plot uh, on the same data with the, the test scores that we saw before, our scores run between the 40s and all the way up to the 90s. So that means our stems would be 4 through 9, and then our leaves that come off of those stems 
are the ones places associated with that. So to give you an example, when we start it, our stems are going to be, so there's our stems 4 through 9, and in the 4 stem, I'm going to look at the numbers in the 40s, so 47, 45, 43, and I'm going to pick the smallest one. So the smallest one's 43, I'll put a 3 there. All right? And then the next biggest one after that is 45, so I'll put a 5 there. And then the next biggest and the biggest one in this stem is 47. So when I make this, let me, when I make this, I have to do that. What the, um, what we're seeing here is these numbers, these are the tens, these are the ones. So this is 40 plus 3, 43, 45, 47. So we're seeing um, what the numbers are in each category. So basically what we're going to end up with here is something that is identical to what we got with this um, this before and, and what we could have plotted easily with this, but it is going to be a, um, we actually get to see the numbers. This, you know, we know three numbers in this class showed up in the data, but it could have been 40, 40, and 40. It could have been 45, 45, 45. It could have been 40, 48, 49. We don't know what the three were, but if we do a stem plot, we can see what the measurements were. That's the benefit of a stem plot over a histogram or a frequency distribution. We can actually see what the data set was when we're doing this. All right, now here's what it would look like if we completed it. There's the, the like I just showing you some of the numbers from the first row of this. If we just went through the first row and grabbed the numbers, but if we actually eventually completed it, notice we get a a nice looking display of this. And this looks very much like a histogram. If we just rotated it and ignored the numbers, and, it, and this was the four or five, you know, numbers in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, these this would just be a histogram, you know, again, if we ignored the numbers. But because the numbers are in there and we can see the actual measurements from the data set, then it is a stem plot, stem and leaf plot. All right, now things that you don't want to do when you're creating uh, graphs or displays and things that just happen too often and, and it's not by accident most of the time are deceptions in visual displays because they want to have an agenda with, with the data that they're showing. So notice this is 11.3 to 12.9 and over here, we are using a scale that goes from 11, no tenths, all the way up to 19. So depending on how far you zoom in on things, you can display uh, a completely different message. This looks like there was a lot of growth over time, and then it's the same amount of time, and it looks like there was hardly any growth, you know, that the growth wasn't that dramatic. So dramatic appearing growth, and, and not very dramatic appearing growth, but it's the exact same data set. Um, and it just depends on, um, you know, who, who would, um, who would be presenting this? You know, uh, you know, th this would be a politician saying, you know, we need to get this candidate out of office because look, the poverty rate has skyrocketed over the last four years. And then this might be the same candidate they're trying to kick out of office to say, no, it's not been that bad over the four years I've been in office. So anyway, that's just just to give you an idea of of how we can deceive with the exact same data set and, and convey two different messages. All right, there's some things to watch out for with your visual displays. Um, typically, you want to have a title so people can know what it is they're looking at. And then the, the tick marks on the vertical axis, the scale needs to be indicated. Uh, you don't want the scale to be you know, you don't want a whole lot much of negative space in there, All right? This this negative space that was taken up by this bu this little bullet that identified the graph, um, that's that's very deceptive to have a a scale that that's off like that. 
All right, uh, cosmetic effects. We're going to look at an example eventually where there's some cosmetic effects that really distort the message that you're trying to convey. Uh, you need to make sure not to. Uh, it's it's fine to 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 make your data look nicer or to to try to draw in people and try to keep their attention, but you don't want to sacrifice the true meaning of the data and the true interpretation of the data to do that. All right, and then has the wrong impression been created? Um, because those equally spaced time intervals are not used. All right, this is perfectly fine. We got a year for each uh, space, but there are some examples of uh, of the horizontal axes being, you know, one gap being five years, and then one gap being one year, and another gap being three years. You know, they they change how many years pass on the horizontal axis to try to keep a consistent look to the data which is very very deceptive when when something like that happens all right uh the bars sizes are they scaled proportionally in terms of the data they represent so again that's another t type of thing that happens when you start to make your your displays too fancy you can a lot of times um tweak the, the sizes of the bars and make them like 3d and when you add a third dimension you know if you want to try to make them look 3d or something a lot of times you can uh, change the message because now we're looking at volume rather than area. And uh, area and volume are two completely different concepts. All right, and then a source. Can you identify where this came from? You know, you're just giving me data, but maybe I want to see it to believe it, basically, is the idea. So here's an example of a very misleading display. So this is a, a cosmetic effect and how cosmetics can affect what we're seeing. So what this graph is trying to, just, to tell us is that the average number of square feet in a, in a home is growing over time. So from 1980 to 2010, we went from 1740 to 2080 to 2392. And if you follow the shadows here, it kind of looks like that's linear growth, um, if, if you're looking at it that way. But a couple of things that are, are misleading that it points out here is, is the width of the homes, which, again, that's part of what they're trying to convey here. But uh, the horizontal axis scale is, is growing. So this, this width is 1980 to 1990. That's a 10-year period and 20-year period. But it's a much wider gap than it was before. You know, the 10-year period, it's not, it's not just double the gap. But the other, the other thing is is the linear look of this, and it's very deceptive. So I've added the um, the the data to Excel, and so 1980, 17, 40, all right, 1990, 2080, and then 2010, 2392, and you can see that it's not linear. It, it's not. It doesn't just keep growing on a straight line. It's starting to slow in its growth. Right, it's yes, it is still higher than it was, but it's not on the same path, and it's not the, the type of growth that they're suggesting, which is like a straight line path that we're on. Okay, so it's a very deceptive graph. Um, it 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 was just done to convey a message of growth with a you know with a fancy picture, a, 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 what we call a cosmetic effect, but. Uh, it, it kind of distorts the message and kind of makes it insinuate that that the growth is is out of control and it's and it's you know growing um, steadily at the, some linear growth rate, but it's not at all. All right. The, the, the again the big two problems are you know between here and here that's a gap of ten years and between here and here that's a gap of twenty years. So it's really over time it's got Instead of a linear growth rate, it's got something that we call a log growth rate, a logarithmic growth. All right, just got to be careful with your displays and just and try to make sure that the message that you're wanting to convey is done. You want to you want to do something to to pull the reader in, but you don't want to lose the message. You don't want to lose the true meaning of the the data and and just, and give a message that you're not intending to give.